Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Today I would like to briefly share with you the news of two major recent scientific discoveries that I encourage you to explore if you have not done so already. While I personally am not a biologist, I am certainly a great enthusiast of research that ultimately improves human life by studying the causes of diseases and how they might be cured. Ultimately, of course, the desired objective is to get rid of as many diseases as possible, to lengthen human lifespans as much as possible, and ultimately to achieve indefinite human longevity. And these discoveries are quite remarkable in their own light as major steps, not only in the fight against specific diseases, but furthermore in the proof of concept that they illustrate. I've provided some links to articles in the references section accompanying this video, and you can read these articles to get more technical details about these discoveries. As a layman, I can only summarize them in general terms, but here is my attempt. The first discovery has to do with the cause of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, also commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. This is a debilitating disease that causes progressive muscular degeneration and eventual death in everyone who has it. The most famous person with this disease right now is Dr. Stephen Hawking, the renowned and very brilliant British physicist. He is also the longest living known person with this disease, and hopefully he will continue living and producing his work for many years and decades to come. But uh, up until now, the cause of ALS has not been known. The disease was observed to lead to this progressive deterioration, but scientists didn't really know why. Now a team of neurologists at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, led by Dr. Tipu Siddiq, have discovered the cause, essentially. And the article that I've linked goes into more detail, but it's essentially a breakdown of a cellular recycling system within the neurons of the brain and the spinal cord one of the proteins that they identified as a key component in the system is the ubiquitin 2 protein. This is the protein that's supposed to repair and dispose of damaged proteins. When this protein breaks down, essentially the chain of events that results in the deterioration we see with Lou Gehrig's disease takes place. So this is obviously a very impressive discovery in scientific terms, but I'd like to briefly talk about what it means in philosophical terms, in terms of how we ought to approach life in general and situations where some of us might be afflicted with these kinds of absolutely horrible, devastating diseases. In my latest Running From Death broadcast, Running From Death number 10, I discussed an article in the New York Times by Dudley Clendenin, who had recently become afflicted with ALS. And Mr. Clendenin essentially said that he doesn't want to let this disease take its full course, that when it debilitates him enough to prevent him from doing the activities that he does to enjoy life, he will essentially try to find a way to end his life very quickly. I think this discovery highlights the impropriety of that approach, the impropriety of giving up on life, and instead it should serve as an urgent reminder to all of us that as long as we are alive, as long as we continue to exist in whatever state, even if it's a very painful state, even if it's a state where it doesn't seem like there's any possibility of recovery, 
there's always hope. There's always hope because science progresses. And as science progresses, it will find how diseases come about, what causes them, whereas that might not have previously been known. It will also find, after knowing the cause, the cure. The cure for ALS of course, still has not been discovered, but Dr. Siddiq and his team are very enthusiastic that now that we know what failures bring this disease about, the drugs to treat it can be invented. It's very unfortunate that in the United States it takes so many years to test the drugs and get them out into the open market, largely because of the bureaucratic encumbrances imposed by the Food and Drug Administration. I would have wished that this process were much faster or that there were a free market system of competing certifications that would enable reliable drugs to be tested but to also reach the patients who needed them as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, we do not have that today. So it may take years for the ALS drugs to actually benefit patients. However, in the meantime, those who have ALS should hold out for hope, because it is quite possible that they will survive in the meantime and see the benefit of those drugs. And I really do hope that Mr. Clendon and himself has found out about this discovery and maybe has reconsidered his decision to part with his life as quickly as he might have done otherwise. The second discovery that I would like to touch on today is a collaborative discovery made possible by a distributed computing initiative from the University of Washington. You may be familiar with Rosetta at Home. It is a massively popular distributed computing initiative designed by Dr. David Baker. And essentially what it studies is protein folding configurations. Proteins, of course, are extremely complex molecularly and as they fold in three dimensions it takes a lot of computer processing power to figure out exactly how that happens. It's not yet possible to just look at the molecule that comprises a particular protein and directly infer from that how it folds. A lot of computation has to be performed. And computers are not yet particularly good at spatial kinds of reasoning. Often human intuition can actually do that better. So in addition to the general Rosetta project, which anyone can run on his or her computer, and it would automatically do the calculations, David Baker and his team developed a game called Foldit. And Foldit essentially allows the user to use his own intuition and try out various combinations that may not have been recommended algorithmically but may actually be better than what the computer would come up with. So in this effort, a major discovery has been made. Essentially, the folding configuration of an enzyme of an AIDS-like virus has been figured out by the users of Foldit. This is the first known scientific discovery that was arrived at via a computer game. This compound is called a monomeric protease enzyme, and it's also been referred to as a retroviral protease of the Mason Pfizer monkey virus, and it essentially causes a disease in monkeys which is very similar to AIDS in humans. This is not AIDS itself, However, it is a big step forward in understanding how these kinds of molecules actually fold, what they actually look like in three dimensions. And of course, it has given humans the ability to predict that particular configuration. Now, of course, this process with one very successful result involved a lot of attempts, a lot of iterations by various people. About 600 players participated from 41 teams and about 1.25 million candidate solutions were submitted. About 5,000 of those were 
identified as being very promising and then subjected to x-ray crystallography by a team of scientists in Poland. And it's really remarkable when you have all this computing power and you have all of this human input from enthusiasts, fairly ordinary people who just want to contribute to an advance that would make life better for humanity, increase the scientific knowledge available to humans. When you have all of that and you have a system that can filter out the best from that vast pool of input, then wonderful things can happen. I think this outcome in particular can result in very good things for the future of scientific discovery. It's essentially one new possible pathway of approaching it instead of just having a few very highly trained and skilled PhD scientists working on their own. You have collaborative input from hundreds and thousands and perhaps someday millions of people either just devoting their computing resources or even devoting their intuition, their hunches at what might work. It's amazing to think what would happen if the huge numbers of human beings that are out there can devote even a little bit of their leisure time to solving these pressing problems that we have. Of course, computer games are tremendously addictive. Millions of people spend many, many hours every week playing them because of the incentive structure built into computer games, the reward structure, the idea that one is making visible progress, the idea that there is something very concrete, at least in terms of what's on the screen, that can be accomplished. It's gripping to a lot of people. And if it's possible to take that kind of motivation scheme and channel it into something so eminently productive as scientific research, then many, many wonderful discoveries will result. The two discoveries that I've discussed today certainly make me extremely enthusiastic with regard to the future of research on human diseases with these innovative new approaches taking advantage of the best minds of our time and the best technology of our time we may just make breakthroughs in diseases which have had scientists stumped for years. And wouldn't that be wonderful?